Yo, all Snapchat, so I've watched these awesome pieces of content over the last few days. One is the talk by David Graeber called Debt the First 5,000 Years. Another one is a, a video about Frederick Hayek, and another one, a doco called Boom Bust Boom. My good mate Tristan put me onto this David Graeber talk, and it's really cool. He talks about the history of debt and how it all kind of came about. Um, and it's quite interesting because it's different to what we've been normally taught about the barter system coming first. The usual historical progression we're taught is that, you know, such as the barter system, you know, I have one cow, you have ten chickens, we do a spot trade. And then came the, the credit system, currency, and then the debt system, banking. He argues that instead the original form of money was actually credit, so it was based on this idea of just helping out your neighbours, you know, mutual benefit. Um, if your neighbours need a chicken, you just give them chickens, and you remember that, and you get paid back. Then every few months a whole village would get together and run a jubilee, where they'd basically work out who, who owes each other what, and they just square off the debts. You know, if that person owes them two chickens, that person owes them two whatever, they just cancel them. This meant that the whole system was very much self-policing, as a credit-based system, not a debt-based system, where everyone's debts very quickly go back to zero, and it's all about uh, social obligation to each other, rather than any... There's also some other really good interesting points uh, in terms of the historical aspect of money. He was kind of saying that money really only came about because of soldiers and violence. That was the only reason that, that money was useful back then. The average villagers never really had any use for silver and gold coins because they were all working on this kind of like uh, IOU credit-based system where they were just helping each other out. But soldiers are a bit different. Partly because you don't want to enter into a credit-based IOU system with a, an armed soldier. I mean, how can you trust that they're just not going to you know, stab you and take all your money away or not repay you? And soldiers much prefer gold and silver because they can carry it with them, they can steal it from other people, um, and no one's asking questions. Everyone, anyone will take gold and silver. Um, they don't have to worry about IOUs. And since the kings, the monarchs, basically owned all of the gold and silver mines, they owned the whole money supply, um, there was no really incentive for them to like push that money into the general populace. But there was with soldiers. Because if you've got an army of 100,000 soldiers and you need to work out how to feed them because they're going to basically eat everything within walking distance within a couple of days, um, you can either hire 100,000 people to feed them, which would suck, or all you do is just like use the, the gold mines you already have, stamp your coins, give some coins to all the soldiers, and now suddenly you have your entire population working to feed the soldiers and clothe them. Which again is a bit of a counterintuitive historical thing, because we often think that um, governments and free markets are kind of clashing against each other, but in historical terms, governments actually created the free markets. I'm just throwing out random paraphrasing of what I'm remembering of this talk as a long talk. Um, another cool thing he said was that typically in most kingdoms, um, no one paid any income tax. People actually had a negative income Apparently the government in Athens actually pay people to vote. So the only time they actually impose a, an income tax was on a conquered population, almost as a social debt. A social and that income tax on a conquered population wasn't so much about the actual revenue generating, it was more about the social influence and manipulation. The, um, the IOUs, the uh, buying loyalty, you have to help me now. The I'm the magnanimous leader, you know, I, you, you should be happy I didn't kill you. So in return, you need to pay me a little bit of, uh, a little bit of return for that, you know, a little bit of money. And apparently it's quite common for new kings to just cancel everyone's debts. As, as again, again, another like social buying loyalty. It's like, well, here you go, I've cancelled all your debts. Now, work harder for me and give me loyalty. And this really brings it back to the whole big issue of uh, economics over the last century or two. You know, the, the Keynesian model of government intervention and top-down order versus the Austrian Hayek model of free market. Economists and governments kind of view the, the economy as this like uh, artificial... Um, kind of mathematical entity that you can control and everyone's a rational actor. But the economy is really just a collective result, a collective outcome of billions of transactions made by human monkeys. Us. Irrational monkeys. So really economics should be more of a study in uh, history, in evolution, human evolution and in human psychology more than a mathematical physics-based game. In one of those videos, they talked to this lady who uh, ran a scientific study with, um, I think, racist monkeys, where they gave them, they taught them how to use money, so they had their own monkey currency, these little, like, silver coins. The monkey could buy grapes with the coins from one of two humans. The first human showed them one grape, and then the monkey would buy it, and then the human would give them a bonus grape. The second human, they'd show them three grapes, the monkey would buy it, they'd take away a grape. And so if the monkey was a rational actor, it would know that it's always going to get two grapes each way, so it would buy from either person regardless, it wouldn't really matter. But the monkey was irrational, it always chose the, the human who gave them a bonus grape, um, even though it, it ended up with two anyway. It didn't trust the person who took away a grape. And since humans are from the same kind of evolutionary tree, we're essentially still primates and monkeys, we too make irrational decisions. So the idea was to maybe we uh, cater our economic systems for that. Like the free market system is awesome, but it's designed in a way that tries to conform the irrational human monkey towards its system. The free market system only works if every actor is very rational. So to avoid these busts and booms and these like, you know, never-ending debt cycles, we need to work out how to design our free market economic systems, our bottom-up self-evolving systems, to work with the irrational monkey. <laughs> so 
So another interesting point in that guy's talk was this idea that throughout most of world history, the, the most you know, worst case scenario that everyone had was that everyone would fall so deeply into debt they'd have to sell themselves into slavery. And then he said, well, if Aristotle were here today, he'd look at everyone working, you know, all day to work for others to pay off their debts, you know, 12-hour days and renting themselves out to others. He'd see that as the nightmare scenario. And since I was about 15 or 16, I've always seen jobs as slavery. I mean, you're basically selling your entire life to the highest bidder, your limited resource life. Literally, it's, it's slavery. But the problem is that jobs are like an institutionalized indoctrination uh, to the point of like Stockholm Syndrome. People are like, you know, I, I, you have to have a job. What do you talk about? How else would you pay for things? How else would you live? We're born into a system that, <laughs> that requires servitude to this, this whole notion of jobs, this whole notion of working for others for, for income, for pay, for the ability to pay for rent. And Why do your parents want you to have a good education? Because you'll get a good job and good pay. The whole education system from kindergarten to year 12 and then tertiary college, it's all about what are you going to become? What job are you going to do? When you grow up, what type of slave would you want to be? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's a bit harsh. People are going to get pissed off by this, but it's, it's, if you look at it that way, it's, it's not different. And every political campaign is always about jobs. Governments are always about jobs and growth, jobs and growth, jobs and growth. Um, <laughs> it'd be interesting to see a unemployment stat related directly to technological automation. Oh, sorry, more random thoughts. So another thing that talk uh, the guy mentioned was the IMF, where they basically serve to protect the creditors, not the debtors. Um, so they require like third world countries to always pay their debts back. And I think he was telling some story to some lady where um, some third world country had so much debt that they were having to pay back their interest on, that, on those loans, meaning they couldn't afford for healthcare, and as a result, like, children died. And then he asked, like, should we just cancel all their debts? And she was like, no, 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 you can't do that. That's, that's, you, you know, that's not what you do. A lender always pays their debts. So you can see how debts kind of warps our own morality and ethics. Similar thing when you get a job. Like, it doesn't feel like you're helping out your neighbor, helping out your boss. It doesn't feel like an IOU credit type system. It's, it's, they own you. And if you don't do your 40, at least 40 hours a week, they'll fire your ass. And it seems that most people are only paid just enough to have at least maybe um, one month or two months of savings. So if they get fired, they have no time to think. They're going to look for the next job, the next bullshit job. And this brings up some thoughts from this guy, uh, Jack Fresco, who uh, is behind the Venus Project. And he always talks about a resource-based economy where there's no money in the system. Money is kind of like the limiting factor in our human progress. Like right now on Spaceship Earth, we have more than enough resources and, and, and technology to be able to give everyone abundance, to you know, give everyone food, shelter, clothing, water, and everyone to live happily. There's this concept of growing in popularity around the world called a basic income or a universal basic income where everyone, regardless of, of income, gets the same amount, enough to pay for all your basic needs, food, shelter, water. It would start off at maybe 10 grand per year, but then it would grow to say 20, 30, 40 grand per year, maybe even 50 grand per year, meaning that you wouldn't have to work if you didn't want to, but you could still work on top of that. This Venus Project uh, resource-based economy takes that a, a step further and basically says, well, let's just get rid of money altogether and just give everyone those free needs. You know, if you need, if you need food, if you need clothing, just go and get it. Using robotics and automation, you'd basically try to bring down the cost of all human commodities and basic needs to near zero cost. Um, and then that enables everyone to go and pursue their own passions and actually enjoy life. Okay, so I've mostly like just bitched and moaned about jobs and how shit it is. So how do we transition to this like utopian, protopian world? Well, I don't think politics will do it. No fuck. Even something as simple as a basic income, I don't see governments implementing that anywhere in the world because to pay for it at a, at a huge scale would require new taxes and no government's going to get elected on new taxes. So the only technology that we have available at our fingertips right now as a, as a species that can transition us in an open peer-to-peer bottom-up way is the blockchain it's in Ethereum. Okay, so I'll try to blast through a bunch of ideas really quickly because um, each of these are like their own little videos so I'm probably going to wait too long. So one is like uh, basic income uh, supplied via blockchain. There's a guy I mentioned before doing a thing called taxines, which basically means that uh, it tries to like distribute dividends and value between each other so that companies have an incentive to provide to this basic income. And what I like about DAOs is it's removing the power away from profit motives in companies because uh, these companies basically are run by code. Code can work at zero profit. It only has to pay for its costs. Then one of my ideas, Isocoin, is this idea of creating uh, mirror-pegged uh, cryptocurrencies for each world currency as a way to kind of extract value away from the banks towards a cryptocurrency everyone uses. Removing the monetary power and issuing away from the banks and government was the whole point of Bitcoin, but it never reached that because it never reached mainstream appeal because it's too hard to use and it's speculative. It goes up and down. But if we can get everyone using cryptocurrencies on a daily basis, it gives power back to the people because there is no issuing control. There's no control over the monetary system. We are the monetary system. Yeah. Then I have another concept called Jobs RPG, um, which basically would end up being kind of like a universal like problem solution. Everyone registers their skills on there and they're, they're matched with problems to solve. Well, there was my other idea, a video a few weeks back called um, something about like DAO, uh, DAOs for purpose, like collecting everyone under a single DAO to work together to solve something. 
Meaning rather than working for a particular industry or a particular job, you'd be working to solve a grand challenge. Stuff like, you know, a Mars colony or solving, curing cancer, like some big challenge. You work together with everyone. And because it's a decentralized distributed system, everyone has equity and ownership in the outcome of that. So no one's, no one's profiting. Everyone's profiting together, but no one's competing against each other. We're working together. Sorry, too much information, very quickly. <laughs> Overwhelming. Um, another one is like a global governance DAO. What if we get rid of governments altogether? We remove their violent operations, their armies, and we just all work together as peer-to-peer. -to -peer. So anyway, there's a few random thoughts. I hope you got something out of that. Um, yeah, this is a very complicated topic, uh, and it's something I'm, I'm trying to solve. If you've got any ideas, let me know at Future.